Uh, good morning, everyone. Great to see you up uh, bright and early uh, after a really um, lovely kickoff to our, our weekend last night with uh, Professor Balin's keynote. Uh, Professor Adorno will take questions at the end of her talk this morning. I have a couple other brief announcements. Uh, spaces are still available for the Sunday morning excursion to South County um, to, to a number of Native American sites led by uh, Lynn Fisher and Christine DeLucia. Also, we have many uh, coffee mugs for sale, the JCB 50th coffee mug for $10. And map facsimiles are for sale um, in spaces around the conference also. And now I will introduce this morning's uh, speaker. We talked a bit about uh, the conference of 1960 that led to the creation of the Fellows Program last night. And the report that summarized its conclusions praised the JCB for its hemispheric vision. It used a slightly unfortunate adjective in describing that vision. It said the JCB was impressively all-American. Um, and we are, um, and we're grateful that we are, and we always have been. We also talked about the 1846 major set of purchases that we now date the origin of the library to. And it's clear that John Carter Brown himself, for reasons that are not entirely clear, was, was deeply interested in this hemispheric vision. And um, many of the books on those long lists of inventories, the orders coming from Henry Stevens in London, uh, uh, describe books printed in Latin America or about Latin America, uh, about of the 1,200 or so books he bought that year in 1846, about 20% were Lima imprints. And if you add uh, the books printed in Mexico and elsewhere in Latin America, it's closer to 25 or 30%. So a very significant chunk of the original cache of books that were coming across the Atlantic to the home of John Carter Brown were either printed in Latin America or about Latin America. And that has uh, raised interesting questions that um, have not entirely been answered. Uh, it's 1846 is a complicated year for the relationship between the United States and, and Latin America. It's the beginning year of the war with Mexico. And it is remotely conceivable that he was interested in Latin America for uh, reasons related to that war. There was certainly a lot of material in the, in the uh, periodical press in the mid-1840s about Mexico for exactly uh, that reason. But also, he was a conscientious purchaser of books, and he, one of his great strengths early on was that he was buying major libraries, entire libraries. And among the libraries he bought was one assembled by a US consul. Excuse me. <laughs> Could I ask you all to turn off your cell phones? Uh, <laughs> Um, Obadiah Rich, the U.S. consul in uh, Valencia, Spain in 1815 and later in Madrid, was uh, a purchaser of books about Latin America, and John Carter Brown bought his library. So, um, so I think we should hesitate before deciding with too much certainty why he was doing these purchases. Um, the person who will be uh, elucidating some of these mysteries for us today is a, is a great friend of the John Carter Brown Library. Rolena Adorno is the Ruben Post Hallett Professor of Spanish and Chair of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at Yale University. She's a 1964 graduate of the University of Iowa. I received her PhD in Spanish literature from Cornell University in 1974. And she has held tenured posts at Syracuse, Ohio State, uh, Michigan, and Princeton before coming to Yale in 1996. Um, she has written or edited um, many books on Spanish uh, 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 literature, Spanish-American literature. And she has brought her findings to the JCB on numerous occasions. She spoke here at the annual meeting of our associates in 2008. And her talk was published in our newly revived annual uh, publication of the, the annual report of the associates of the JCB. Her most recent book is Colonial Latin American Literature, a very short introduction published by Oxford University Press. Other recent books in English include The Polemics of Possession in Spanish American Narrative uh, and um, a three-volume study of uh, Cabeza de Vaca, which she co-authored with her former student Patrick Charles Potts in uh, 1999, and which received many prizes in 2000 from the American Historical Association, the Western Historical Association, the New England Council of Latin American Studies. Um, 
She's now working on a study of the ways in which the United States uh, considered the Latin American world in the middle of the 19th century. Um, she fits in her research, I'm not sure how, between numerous, uh, numerous responsibilities, abilities, including most recently, um, uh, she was appointed by President Obama in 2009 to a five-year post on the National Council of the Humanities, the Ad advisory board of the NEH, and I was pleased to hear her uh, thanking Stephanie Walker just before this talk about the, the great service the NEH has done to all of us and to the fellowship program in particular. So without further ado, let me uh, welcome all of you back and uh, welcome our old friend, Relena Adorno, to speak to us this morning. Thank you, Ted, very, very much. It is fine to be considered an old friend of the JCB, and I'm very happy uh, to assume that title. I hope this morning to compliment Professor Balin's keynote of last evening, which we all enjoyed so much with my own presentation. Whereas he was speaking about the founding family of the JCB, the Browns, I'm going to speak about some more recent, some present, some not, personalities important to the JCB. And whereas Professor Balin was on that committee in 1960 that helped bring the fellowship program into existence in 1962, I have been the benefactor of that work as a JCB fellow in 1985. The hemispheric approach, I'll ad lib just at the start. It was, after all, Thomas Jefferson who wrote to his nephew that he really ought to add the study of the Spanish language to his set of accomplishments. Because he said, after all, you know, the early part of our history is written chiefly in Spanish. And that was part of the vision that John Carter Brown surely had going forward. During those war years, yes, it is the case that uh, William Hickling Prescott, during the war years with Mexico, was in correspondence with Joaquin Garcia Caspalceta as they worked together on common projects. It's always a healthy reminder that politics don't obscure all important cultural and intellectual relationships. And on da Obadiah Rich, I could say more, but I shan't. The JCB, from a Hispanist Latin American, Latin Americanist perspective, is simply heavenly. So in Spanish, in referring to the site of the JCB, I always call it la divina providencia. <laughs> that is, divine providence in a secular geographical sense, while for the period and places to which I devote my scholarship, la divina providencia is divine providence used to describe the supernatural force that won the battles, delivered the conquests of native Amerindian populations, and in short, brought Spain to the Americas at the end of the 15th century and sustained her dominion here for there for three and a half centuries. Divina Providencia. It is always a great pleasure to be back at the JCB, and on this special occasion, I am proud to announce that I am a member of the JCB Fellows Class of 1985-86. And just in case you don't believe me, <laughs> here is my Gaudeo JCB book uh, uh, t-shirt, which is of course the book plate of John Carter Brown, and it was during that summer that I, it was Norman or some clever member of the staff who managed to bring these to the picnic that we had at Mount Hope Farm on the old uh, Hafenreffer estate on Bristol Bay. This is July 1985. I was planning to wear it, but I thought it was a bit too informal for this occasion. <laughs> In any case, in any case, I remember several of the fellows from that time, and I see at least Jack Crowley, who was with me uh, that summer uh, uh, during that wonderful period for all of us who appreciated it so much. What the JCB means to all of us who work on the Iberian and Ibero-American worlds is far too long and complex a tale to tell here. I marvel 
at the JCB's ever more remarkable and now newly relaunched website, increasingly rich in information and access. The JCB's new sources of Peru site, the Internet Archive Peru collection, and the prospective pros pro projects that Ted uh, mentioned last night of digitizing the Brazilian collections and the indigenous uh, languages project in which Google will play a role. But as I think of images alone that you can see on the website, I can only think back to 1985, and I think it was hundreds of 35 millimeter photo photographic slides that I ordered uh, during that time, those 27 years ago, keeping photographer Richard Hurley busy all that summer, I think, with my relentless requests. When I arrived, Oh, we need one more. Yes, one more audiovisual helper here. When I arrived at the JCB in June of 1985, Norman Firing had been at the helm two years. And as you know, his tenure extended from 1983 through 2006. A few snapshots here for you. Oh, there are some readers in the reading room. <laughs> in the dark, but not really. Yes. This happens to be October of 1989, and two JCB fellows of that year are pictured here, Regina Harrison and Teodoro Ampe Martinez, both of whom I believe are here today. I know that Reggie is. And notice, first of all, what has not changed. Uh, this is the good old storage and coffee room. I don't know what its official name was uh, in the basement. And of course, what hasn't is the very beautiful, now called the Macmillan Reading Room, which we all admire so much. And then finally, at that time, we were looking at here the progress of the to be erected Casperson Building, this spectacular new construction that doubled the size of the library's premises. Norman was also responsible not only for these things, but for increasing the library's endowment tenfold, for extending the research pro fellowship program to make it a venue for international scholars, adding some 5,000 rare books in a dozen languages to the collections, all of them primary sources for the study of the Americas from Hudson Bay to Patagonia. The recataloging of some 80% of the JCB's collections and making its records available online and initiating in 2001 the archive of Early American Images Project were just some of his major accomplishments. But we know that the dream project, even from the mid-80s when we were here, was the creation of the re residence for scholars that opened the year after Norman retired and certainly with the enormous help of Ted Widmer on June 1st, 2007. It was formally dedicated, as you can see here, in Norman's honor in October of 2009. Norman's support for the Iberian and Ibero-American worlds has been registered by honors bestowed on him by national governments. No small recognition. In 2002, the government of Brazil made Norman a commander of the Order of Rio Branco. This award recognized his work at the JCB for more than 20 years, promoting the study of Brazilian history and culture. In 2003, the Spanish government made him a commander of the Order of Isabella Católica in recognition of his long dedication to promoting the culture and history of both Spain and the former Spanish colonies. And we see this same kind of leadership going forward now, so aware of the Ibero-American world that Ted Widmer is carrying out as director. So Hispanists, Latin Americanists, luso brazilianists we have much to be pleased about. But back to 1985. The excitement of the JCB at the time was the production of the European Americana, the chronological guide to works printed in Europe relating to the Americas, 1493 to 1750. Its six volumes were published between 1980 and 1987. And when I arrived at the JCB, my first act was to acquire the first two volumes. 
Volume 1, 1493 to 1600, and which had been published in 1980, and Volume 2, 1600 to 1650, which had appeared in 1982. Now, the first volume was edited by John Alden, as it says on the cover page, with the assistance of Dennis C. Landis. The second volume was edited by them jointly, Alden and Landis. And volumes three through six were exclusively edited by Dennis Landis with the collaboration of Leslie Tobias, now Leslie Tobias Wilson, and Susan Newberry also participating. The European Americana, and here you see in its staid book, Don't We Love Books, form, really fulfilled a tremendous need among scholars, and it remains one of my most basic and satisfying research tools. How it had come about, it's worth remembering. In 1967, Mr. Albert Boney of the Redex Microprint Corporation, according to JCB director Thomas Adams' account, quote, had the imagination to recognize and appreciate the need for a large-scale undertaking in future scholarship, service to scholarship. And in 1968, Mr. Boney began by making possible, by computerization, a chronological index to Joseph Sabin's 1866 bibliography. That had been, there's Mr. Sabin, the Biblioteca Americana, a dictionary of books relating to America from its discovery to the present time. And it was published in a period spanning six decades. It was, however, an alphabetical by author listing. So the European Americana didn't just update Sabin, going to a chronological order that uh, bibliographers such as Ob Obadiah Rich had used, but it also created the focus. The European Americana, meaning works on the Americas, as broadly conceived as John Carter Brown had conceived them, uh, that were published in Europe at the time. Now, this might seem to be a limited focus, but it's hardly a limitation because it is an extraordinary output. And when the distinguished bibliographer John Alden, who was keeper of rare books at, uh, for the Boston Public Library, retired, he made his services available to the European Americana Project, and that was one of its steps close to the very beginning. Funding was secured then from the Division of Research Grants for Research Materials from the National Endowment for the Humanities, which was a great supporter of that project, and certainly the fellowship programs here at the JCB. That is ultimately, that program has been ultimately uh, morphed and subsumed into the Division of per Preservation and Access under its grant program, Humanities Collections and Reference Resources. In addition to the NEH funding, a further substantial contribution was made by the Redex Microprint Corporation, and so, Mr. Adams reported, the project began in earnest, earnest in the fall of 17 of 19, excuse me, just a century or two off, you know. <laughs> but there were very important 18th century bi bibliographers, as you are aware. I just cut them out of my talk for purposes of time. In any case, to return to that great summer of 1985 and my three months as a JCB fellow, I made many acquaintances, but one of the most enduring is Jose Amor y Vasquez, Pepe, Mr. Brown University as he is known to so many. Born in northern Spain, he earned his PhD here at Brown in Hispanic Studies in 1957. And he spent his long and very, very productive career here as, at Brown, as professor of Hispanic Studies. His scholarly work has included a study of the epic poems written on Hernán Cortés and the conquest of Mexico in the 16th century, JCB materials to be sure. He edited one of its most important, uh, one of the most important epic poems of the period, Gabriel Lorbolazo de, la, de las Vegas Mexicana. Here you see its 1588 imprint that was enlarged and published in the 1594 edition, and that was the final edition that Pepe edited. And here you see a picture of its author, the medallion of Gabriel Lobolazo de la Vega, and here of the protagonist and hero of the piece, Hernán Cortés. 
Pepe was also instrumental in editing festschrifts to, festschrifts to former colleagues, Juan Lopez Morillas and William L. Victor, both distinguished professors of this department of Hispanic Studies at Brown, as well as the proceedings of two important international conferences, both again held at Brown, the Second Congress of Galician Studies in 1988 and the 28th Congress of the International Institute of Ibero-American Literature, um, edited, uh, which uh, took place in 1990 and was uh, published in 1994. Now, I'm mentioning these activities, and I hope Pepe is at home watching on television. Pepe, I hope you can see this. If not, you'll read it afterward. The mention of these activities is important because they make clear, and as I can attest as well, over the decades, Pepe Amor has been a steady, welcoming hand to all in Hispanic and Luso-Brazilian studies who have crossed the threshold of the JCB as fellows or the portals of Brown as visiting scholars. In recognition of his contributions, Pepe was awarded the uh, 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 named a commander of the Order of Isabel la Católica uh, in 1998. And in 2003, most appropriately, he received the John Carter Brown Medal in recognition for distinguished service to the library or to one of the fields represented in its collections. He was the third uh, awardee of this important award. Pepe was also a member of the Brown University Faculty Liaison Committee to the JCB since that panel was created in 1982, and he became in 1995 its chairman, and as such, he served as an ex officio member of the JCB's Board of Governors. It is fitting, then, and especially knowing Pepe's great sense of humor, that his most recent publication, as far as I can tell, is the annotated edition published luxuriously by the John Carter Brown Library and the National Academy of History of Venezuela in 2000 of an imprint called El Tapaboca. This rare Latin American independence era work was published in Puerto Rico in 1812, the beginning of the bicentennial years of Latin American independence in the meeting of the Cortes, the National Legislature of Spain at Cadiz. The author of this work, and Pepe discovered it, was a well-known Venezuelan political figure, Andres Lebel de Goda, who opposed the rebellion against Spain and took refuge in Puerto Rico. Now, El Tapaboca, means literally scarf or muffler, but Pepe tells us that metaphorically it was also a slap on the mouth or a crushing remark intended to end all discussion. This then was a polemical and satirical work and it offers a dialogue of opposing views regarding Latin American independence from Spain. It is no surprise to me that this highly coded, keenly cutting and at the same time uproarious work is presented by Pepe who knows at first hand how political disappointment, even bitterness, can be turned into a certain kind of humor that only those who have shared such experiences can fully appreciate. Without question, one of the greatest coups for the JCB, not only in recent years and not only for Latin American studies, but for many areas and over the JCB's long history has been the Murray Bromson bequest. Mr. Bromson, 1919-2005, was a buyer and seller of antiquarian books, pamphlets, newspapers, maps, prints, manuscripts, all relating to the Americas. His prodigious knowledge in all of these matters uh, resulted in his appointment as honorary curator of Latin American books at the JCB in 1996. And in the year 2000, he donated to the library his Simon Bolivar collection, the main feature of which is graphic and includes some 22 engravings of the Latin American, of the South American liberator. For more than 50 years, he dealt broadly in America, Americana, but his great love in JCB reported was colonial Spanish America. Upon his death in 2005, Mr. Bromson left the uh, JCB library uh, an, an enormous cash sum and approximately 10,000 books and several thousand manuscripts. It was one of the largest gifts the library had ever received. And as our friend and former curator, Michael Hamley, 
has explained. From that treasure trove, the staff of the JCB selected approximately 1,500 imprints and at least 500 manuscripts having to do with the Americas during the viceregal and independence periods for inclusion in the library's rare reference and manuscript collections. The remaining items were to be or have been sold in order to augment the Bromson endowments for programs and acquisitions. Included in the Bromson request, and here on a timely note, in this bicentennial year of the promulgation of the Spanish Constitution of 1812, are three imprints published in that year at Cadiz, that is, uh, meeting the uh, national legislature in the safe haven of Cadiz during the Napoleonic Wars and the French occupation of Spain. That tumultuous period, as you know, ended with the independence of the Spanish held possessions in the Americas, save Cuba and Puerto Rico. Of course, one of the greatest results of the Bromson request was the creation of the Maury A. Bromson Curator of Latin American Books, a position inaugurated and now held by our colleague Ken Ward. What I learned only recently about Mr. Bromson was that he had been, in 1951, the founding editor of the Revista Interamericana de Bibliografía, the review of inter-American bibliography, one of the only periodicals devoted at the time to the bibliography of the Western Hemisphere. This quarterly journal was published at the by the Department of Cultural Affairs of the Pan-American Union of the Organization of American States in Washington, D.C. Uh, as an author who has published in the Revista, it's obvious here, isn't it, as well as one of its regular readers, I can attest to the role that it has played in Latin Americanist studies. Mr. Bromson was a member of that Department of Cultural Affairs of the Pan American Union from 1952 to 54, and while there, he promoted the study of the work and careers of the great bibliographers, especially those of the Americas. Having spent two years in Chile, 1941 and 1947, it is no surprise that he understand, understood the work and its importance of the great Chilean bibliographer and historian, Jose Toribio Medina. Mr. Bromson organized an international conference on Medina's work at the Pan American Union in 1952. And in that year, its proceedings were published in English as Jose Toribio Medina, Humanist of the Americas, subsequently in Spanish, Jose Toribio Medina, Humanista de America. Medina was the most prolific and productive bibliographer Spanish America had ever probably seen. He produced volumes and volumes, as Michael Hammerley has observed, meticulous descriptions of publications of all the colonial period presses in Spanish America, beginning with the oldest, those of Mexico, 1539, and Lima, starting in 1584. Medina's seven-volume Biblioteca Hispanoamericana, 1493 to 1810, is a remarkable catalog of materials relating to the disco Spanish discovery and colonization in the Americas. Medina's Biblioteca Hispanoamericana and all of Medina's other bibliographic surveys of printing became standard references on the Spanish-speaking Americas. And in fact, they are still a standard source augmented uh, quite beautifully by the JCB's European Americana now, as we know, online. But why have I spent so much time on Mr. Medina? Because I thought you really ought to know him well before the next chapter in this brief account. Among Bromson, Mr. Bromson's longtime acquaintances, Mr. Bromson earned an MA in Harvard at Harvard in 1945. One of them was Mr. Alfred Al Albert Harkness, Jr. Albert Harkness was a descendant of two distinguished brown professors of classics. Here you see his grandfather, Albert Harkness, and that portrait hangs, I believe, in the library annex, and Mr. Harkness's father, Albert Granger Harkness, whose portrait is on display in the faculty club. Together, father and son taught classics at Brown for a total of 84 years. And 
speaking with Ted just before, I'm reminded that the offspring of uh, distinguished Brown professors who remain at, at, at Providence or come back out of the sheer love of it, Ted is our prime example, is a phenomenon that was not unique. In any case, I bring to mind Mr. Albert Harkness, Jr., not for his ancestors, but for himself, his longtime association with the JCB, and my brief, memorable, personal acquaintance with him one afternoon. I'm so sorry I don't have a photograph of him. One of the great pleasures, as we all know, of the JCB is meeting unexpectedly individuals whom one might otherwise never, ever meet, and then finding these people in one's life or in one's thoughts for a long, long time. Mr. Harkness is, for me, one of those persons. I met him in the reading room on the afternoon of June 26. Don't panic, I keep a diary and I won't overwhelm you with these details. <laughs> 1985. And he was arriving for a meeting of some uh, council group for the JCB. I don't know whether it was the governors or not. I wasn't so well informed about the JCB at the time. But I have been informed uh, very recently by Pepe Amor that Mr. Harkness never had a formal role at the JCB, but was always an enthusiastic observer and participant. After his death, I'll point out now so I don't forget to mention, in his honor, his family established a preservation award in his name at the JCB. And you'll soon see why preservation was so important to him. I took prodigious notes after our meeting that afternoon, and I summed them up with the statement, this I learned on a cool, damp afternoon in June in the reading room of the John Carter Brown Library. Mr. Harkness, you see, was a walking, talking piece of American history, both in geographical exploration, or should I say re-exploration, and in the exploration and settlements bibliography. Exploration history. He had accompanied Samuel Elliott Morrison, here pictured in his gear as Rear Admiral of the US Naval Reserve, and professor of history at Harvard. Professor Balin told me at breakfast that he had taken a course with Professor Morrison, and I will not attribute any remarks to Professor Balin, but allow him to repeat them later, should he care to. In any case, the young Mr. Harkness, the young Mr. Harkness, Harvard, 1938, accompanied Morrison on the Harvard-Columbus expedition of 1939-40. Now, Professor Morrison dedicates his biography of Columbus, Admiral of the Ocean Sea, A Life of Christopher Columbus, to my shipmates of the Harvard-Columbus expedition, Barkantine Capitana Ketch Mary Otis, 1939-40. And Professor Morrison's preface states, among the individuals to whom I am particularly indebted is my staff, he put in quotes, of secretaries, Captain John W. McElroy and Albert Harkness, Jr., both seagoing. After crossing the Atlantic under sail to Spain and back, and, and that story has a few wrinkles in it, not to be disclosed by me, and examining all the shores visited by Columbus in the Caribbean, Morrison wrote Admiral of the Ocean Sea, which was published in 1942 and received a Pulitzer Prize in 1943. I just must mention to you in the internet age that I was, you know, Googling the, uh, one day I said giggling, but it was really Googling, the Harvard Columbus expedition. And I came across the fact that just two days ago, a surviving member of the expedition was giving a lecture at one of his uh, local venues talking about working on that 15-member crew of the Capitana during those years of 1939-40. That would be Mr. Richard Spear. In any case, the story that Mr. Harkness told me continues uh, with the fact that um, he said uh, he 
wanted to go back to graduate school, and so he did at Harvard. But he stuck it out only a year because he was informed that well, although he wanted to take an advanced degree in Latin American civilization, it was possible to do so at the time only in North American civilization. And so he found himself leaving graduate school and in search of a job. So at Brown, he contracted as a photographer to film the great collections of South Americana cataloged by Jose Toribio Medina and uh, as part of the project that had been directed or initiated by JCB director Lawrence Roth, persuading the Rockefeller Foundation in 1940 to provide a grant that would allow for a three-year enterprise whereby one year would be spent in Chile, one at the National Library of Peru in Lima, and a third in the great repositories of Mexico, filming, microfilming, rare imprints and manuscripts. Mr. Harkness signed up, and they started off in Santiago. He recalled that the group discovered that beyond Medina's bibliographic information, there was much more material of interest than had been anticipated, found both at the National Library and at the Casa de Medina Library. During that sojourn, Mr. Harkness recalled, one time a full week's work, which consisted of a roll of 800 exposures, went up in flames when heating the water in a bidet for the purpose of processing the film. You see, the room was being illuminated by, yes, uh, a mariposa. Uh, we don't use mariposas much today, but it was the term used for those little wick things that float on top of oil or on top of water covered with a film of oil. And poof, there went an entire week's work in smoke. The work overall, Mr. Harkness remarked, was extremely slow and imprecise because of the need to adjust the electric lights which electric current was ebbing and surging at will and he as photographer told me that he needed to count to six to be sure of getting each exposure. Now this project was the source of what is known as the FHA Medina Collection, that is the Film Hispanica Americana Collection of positive and negative copies of early South American imprints. It is held here at the, Jays, at, the uh, at Brown University Libraries um, with the positives uh, at the Rock and the neg master negatives at the Hay. And it consists of some 2,400 titles on 250 microfilm rolls. It is still in use at the JCB, although, as NJCB has reported, the library has acquired since those days copies of many of the books that were lacking in 1939. In any case, the project was at that point, truncated. They were unable to continue the work in Lima because the National Library had been destroyed by fire and the preliminary arrangements that had been made in Mexico had to be abandoned because of the scarcity of film and the difficulties of transportation caused by World War II. So the project was completely abandoned by 1943 though the cataloging of its entries, of its individual entries, was carried out by the Library of Congress, completed in 1945, in exchange for a positive copy of the films. And so it was that that is a kind of preview to the state of the art of imaging that we are in today. After his death, as I mentioned, Mr. Harkness's family established a preservation fund here at the JCB in his memory. I am now going to leave Mr. Harkness and that enchanting afternoon in June of 1985 because its purpose has been, you see, to contrast the past with the present and future that is, the present and future of the JCB and its scholarship in the internet era.
Long past the challenges of heating water in a bidet without losing the laboriously harvested fruits of arduous photographic labors, we forge ahead in the digital age to meet the twin goals of preservation and access. I write this with capital letters because preservation and access is, as you know, one of the five divisions of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And preservation and access at the NEH have long been involved with the support of digitization. Nadina Gardner, the director of that division, has written an informal history of those efforts and accomplishments, which is very, very worthwhile reading. Most recently, all of you will know, in response to the uh, enormous interest and demand and potential, the Office of Digital Humanities has been created at the NEH and is alive and thriving. I see the most basic aspect of digitization in the humanities of manuscripts and rare books to be highly promising. It's already so much accomplished, not least because I've had my own personal experience in this area, and it wasn't just yesterday. It was 12 years ago that the Royal Library in Copenhagen, this is the National Library of Denmark, in the person of its forward-looking keeper of rare books, Ivan Bozrup, approached me about becoming the scholarly editor of their project to digitize one of their most precious holdings to which I had devoted the 1970s and I thought I had finished in the 1980s with editing print editions of the work and studying its uh, place in the field of literary cultural history. This was the unique early 17th century manuscript by the Spanish-speaking native of the Andes, Felipe Guamampoma de Ayala, his work in English, and I'll just do it in English, The New Chronicle and Good Government, El Primer Nueva Coronica y Buen Gobierno. Like all such digital projects, the Royal Library sought to meet the twin goals of curatorial conservation and public access. The manuscript is some 1,200 page lo pages long and includes, depending on how you count them, some 399 or 400 full-page pen and ink drawings created by the author. The manuscript was a natural for digitization, and the website has had, over these dozen years, tremendous success. When it, the website, the Wamampoma website at the Royal Library went live in May of 2001, the number of its hits and downloads immediate, that it immediately received was staggering, and they came from all over the world. Even as recent as last week in Lima, one of my colleagues there told me that he always, without fail, uses the website's resources in his courses. But there are websites and websites, and of course the work of the JCB is so important here because for scholarly purposes, sophisticated navigational tools and aids need to be devised. So we did that. But I mention it only to underscore the importance of all of the JCB's initiatives in this area. Now, for the May 2001 inauguration of the website, the Royal Library asked me to write an essay that could be published as a booklet to accompany it. And I thought, why? But now I know. That little book has been in circulation ever since, and it works complementarily to, perhaps as the best possible promotion for, the website itself. And finally, in 2006, we were able to add to the website work, thank goodness, already done in the 1980s, uh, digitized versions of the print editions of the manuscript that John Murra, Jorge Urioste, and I had uh, done in the late 70s and published in Mexico City in 1980 with Siglo XXI and Historia de Asisés in Madrid in 1987 to provide absolutely, um, completely searchable databases. So in my own readerly experience, I found, I have always found, that printed materials and digitized ones are mutually supportive and work hand in hand. It is not, and I think it never will be, an either or proposition of digital versus print. A very exciting project about which I was told last night is for a co-edition of the important bibliographic source on Peruvian materials, Michael Hamley's Magnus Opum, between the JCB and institutions in Peru. One the, or the, and the other, the digital and the print, make possible 
the appreciation of the other. And libraries and archives of precious manuscript and early print materials, the JCB, the Archivo General de Indias in Seville, the great national libraries of Europe, and forward-looking university libraries in our own country know this for a fact. Will the digitized materials, though rare, ever replace the originals? No, never. They actually render them more precious. But the preciousness of resources is not confined to materials only. Precious resources, too, are the skilled librarians, curators, and bibliographers who make them available to us as scholars. How many times have any one of us, as scholars, been astounded when we've asked of a curator, we think a casual question, and have been uh, astonished by the type and breadth of knowledge that they possess and we can only lust after? As we celebrate this weekend the JCB Fellows Program, it is also to t the time to honor as I hope I have just done in my presentation, some of those who make it all possible, the library directors, Norman Firing, and now Ted Widmer, who held and hold a sacred trust and who one after the other have brought us fully into the internet era. The latter day, may I say, John Carter Brown and John Nicholas Brown all rolled into one in the person of Mr. Maury Bromson. And that intrepid young sailor and photographer, Mr. Albert Harkness Jr., counting to six to ensure every exposure. The Danish keeper of rare books and manuscripts who was troubled by the fact that only a handful of scholars and not necessarily those who came from the part of the world where it mattered most could travel to Copenhagen to study the autograph manuscript. These are the stories of a few individuals, but of course individuals always, always uh, account for webs of important relationships. Those relationships are many, and it is not only ours as scholars, but our relationship to the past and the present, and to the librarians who all make it possible for us that I guess I'll say, I think I can say on behalf of all of the fellows here, thank you very much.